yeah so you can see that uh, the triple resonance experiments are basically driven by application to proteins experiments driven by for proteins in fact this has been an extremely useful feedback uh, system that multi dimensional nmr experiments developed but the proteins actually drove them very 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 strongly so the desire to obtain structural information on proteins has been the motivation for developing new and new pulse sequences and you will see therefore all these triple resonance experiments which we will describe are primarily directed towards proteins and therefore we will be concentrating on that kind of a thing structural biology primarily has be, has developed as a result of application of uh, i mean nmr in structural biology has primarily been driven by application in in proteins also of course nucleic acids and other systems but by and large methods development has occurred because of applications to proteins so here i show this slide again to you for the uh, indicating the strategy here we have here a dipeptide nh c alpha co nh c alpha co and the transfer of magnetization happens through this uh, polypeptide chain make either through the backbone alone or through the uh, side chains as well accordingly we have different kinds of pulse sequences here and all these are based on transfers based on j correlations and therefore the j coupling constants are important here these different j couplings are indicated here these are all one bond couplings okay except this which is a two bond coupling and even the two bond coupling also doesn't vary too much as you can see and by and large it is uh, uh, about 4 to 9 hertz but mostly it is in a random coil situation they will be like 6 to 7 hertz and uh, certain structural situations you may have uh, 4 hertz and somewhere it is 9 hertz and things like that but mostly it is one bond couplings and therefore there is no question of missing those peaks in your in the three dimensional experiments okay uh, and how does this work i will illustrate this to you how the transfer happens in a particular i mean in the protein in the um, uh, pulse sequence and we'll illustrate this with one taking one particular example which is called as the constant time uh, hnca i described to you the hnca this is the same, another version of the same one the magnetization transfer follows in this particular path so it starts from the uh, proton as you can see here and this is the amide proton this is here the amide proton which we label here the amide proton is starts from here and then you transfer from this uh, amide proton Uh, using the inept sequence so you have the initial inept sequence here so the magnetization flows from here and comes to nitrogen nitrogen at this point it starts here and comes to nitrogen at this point up to and after that part and then during the next period from here to here it flows in the nitrogen on the nitrogen path it remains on nitrogen and then it is transferred to c alpha so this is the pathway so the magnetization flows in this manner from the amide proton it goes to the nitrogen from the nitrogen it goes to this c alpha and now you see in the amide when it is in the amide portion you have this t1 by 2 increment the t1 increment is present here therefore and it is total time from here to here it is t okay total time from here to here is t and that is why it is called as constant time but in the same one this t1 is in, uh, incorporated okay from here to here it is t therefore it is called as constant time during that time the j evolution happens and during the t1 period is the chemical shift evolution which chemical shift that is nitrogen chemical shift because, because the you have the t1 increment and the magnetization is on the nitrogen therefore during the t1 period we have the nitrogen chemical shift okay and now from this it is from the nitrogen it is transferred to the carbonyl to the c alpha and then i have here you see t2 by 2 t2 by 2 and t2 by 2 this is t2 so total is t2 this is again in increment this is a incrementable time period and therefore what is the chemical shift labeling here if there is an incrementable time period it means there is a chemical shift labeling that frequency is getting labeled with a particular evolution okay during that evolution that particular frequency is getting labeled so therefore during the t2 period i have this c alpha getting labeled in the t1 period n15 is getting labeled 
and during the T2 period C alpha is getting labeled. Now from here it goes flows here and then it goes to nitrogen again. It goes to the nitrogen again and during the nitrogen there is no labeling here. So this is a constant time again this is the same constant time as here T total period from here to here is T and during this time the whatever certain refocusing things like that will happen and it is on the nitrogen. The magnetization is on the nitrogen and then it flows through the nitrogen until here and then it goes back to proton. It goes back to proton here and then during this period there is an extrovert there is a refocusing of the amide proton chemical stage which is antiphase there and you produce at this point E in phase proton magnetization so that they can detect here and therefore what is in the T1 period? T1 period I have the nitrogen chemical shift and T2 period I have the C13, C alpha chemical shift and during the T3 period I have the amide proton chemical shift because what I am going to detect here is coming from the nitrogen from the N15 it is coming to the proton and where does it come? It comes to the proton which is attached to it only therefore it is on the amide proton and the, and the amide proton is refocused here it is antiphase it comes to in, in phase and then you detect this during the T3 period okay. Therefore what do you, after 3D Fourier transformation what do you expect to get? We expect to get a okay. Now this is let us say if I call this as F3, F1 and F2. What will be present in F1? F1 will be nitrogen 15 okay and therefore this will go to F1 uh, F1 this will go to F2 and this will go to F3 okay. So this is the way it goes of course we apply certain pulses on the carbonyl channel etc for the purpose of decoupling etc we may not want to go into those details here but this is the way the magnetization flows and therefore this is the kind of a schematic spectrum you will get okay. Now let us look at this spectrum how does it look this is what I indicated to you here and on this here you have the schematic spectrum of a particular uh, sequence whatever randomly some 4 amino acids are taken here. So how many amino acids are taken here? There is one green, there is one here red and then the cyan and then of course there is another red here, this is brown. Now each one of them has a strong peak here and then also a peak at this point, each one of them has that. So therefore it is indicating as I mentioned to you earlier, you generate the self peak as well as the sequential peak because there is a uh, uh, and this is called as the sequential peak of residue I minus 1. So if you let me go back there and show you what we had there HNCA. So if you look at this, uh, so if you look at this we transferred, we transferred from the amide proton to the nitrogen and nitrogen we transferred to both the C alpha, this C alpha as well as this C alpha. So this is the self residue I and residue I minus 1. Therefore the both the things will have to reflect in your spectrum and that is what is happening here. So you see you have here the two peaks at each amide proton chemical shift two peaks one belongs to its own C alpha other one is to the neighboring C alpha which is the I minus 1 residue same here. Therefore if you took a cross section at a particular N15 chemical shift and these ones are appearing at a different N15 chemical shifts this is through the depth you can go through the N15 here depth. So these ones are different depth these four ones are present at different depths okay. So if I take a cross section at any particular N15, N, any particular N15 this is the F1 axis I have two peaks this one of them is the residue I other one is the residue I minus 1. These ones have slightly different intensities by and large they may not have also but sometimes you do have slightly different intensities because this coupling constant is slightly larger than this coupling constant because this is dependent on the two bond coupling whereas this is dependent on the one bond coupling as we saw this coupling constant is of the order of 7 to 9 hertz whereas this 7 to 11 hertz this coupling constant is of the order of 4 to 9 hertz. 
So, depending upon what it is sometimes you can have different intensities. In fact, it is helpful if it has different intensity it is helpful to figure out that which one is a self and which one is sequential ok. Well, once you have got this now this is the sequential which is I minus 1 residue. Now obviously at some other uh, nitrogen chemical shift this will become the self peak ok when you move through the N15 plane at this particular C alpha this peak will become the self peak because it has to have a particular self peak also. So therefore you search through the N15 plane here then you will find that ok at the particular um, uh, chemical shift then of the N15 you find exactly at the same C alpha chemical shift you all you find a strong peak here. This strong peak therefore is the self peak of residue I-1 and then you correspondingly you have another peak which is the weaker peak which is of I-2. So again you search through the nitrogen 15 planes then you will find a peak which corresponds to the same C alpha chemical shift but at a different nitrogen uh, amide proton chemical shift ok and also the different N15 chemical shift. So therefore you will see a strong peak here and a weak peak here so you can continue like that. So therefore you see you can walk through the polypeptide chain by going through the different N15 planes scan through the N15 planes identify where the C alphas are and you can start connecting the peaks in this manner ok. Once you have the C alphas identified like this obviously you can also identify the other protons through the toxi or you can also use the other ones where you can go to the C betas and so on. So this is a, a, an experiment which is extremely useful ok. Now here the separation will depend upon how good your C alpha chemical shift is and there uh, sometimes the C alpha chemical shifts may not be too, too good and in that situation uh, one has to use the some other strategy and here is an experiment which is called as HNN. So here what you do is I will explain to you the first the strategy how the magnetization transfer happens in this ok. In this experiment the magnetization goes through uh, starts with the N15 uh, amide proton starts to the amide proton and is transferred to the nitrogen of the same residue and it is frequency labeled with a T1 there is a T1 increment there. Now from this T1 you transfer to the C alphas of the two residues I and I minus 1 just as you did in the case of HNCA ok from Ni you transfer to the C alpha of I and also to the C alpha of I minus 1 ok. Now in the earlier case you labeled this C alpha but here we do not label the C alpha we do not make it as a T2 part what we do is we transfer this further to the next nitrogens there from this C alpha during a particular time period here it called 2 times tau Cn you transfer again to the nitrogen of I minus 1 partly to the nitrogen of I minus 1 and partly to the nitrogen of I itself. So this is N I minus 1 and this is N I plus 1 here and this will be I plus 1. So here again this will be I minus 1 because the transfer happens from the Ni to the next residue Ni of uh, C alpha I from the C alpha I it can go to the I plus 1 ok and C alpha I minus 1 its I plus 1 will be I ok. So therefore it can go to I here and part of it remains as I minus 1 here ok. So this is the way the transfer happens and, um, uh, and after this you have got the proton you have the magnetization on the nitrogens of 3 uh, residues I, I minus 1 and I plus 1 and this is then transferred to the corresponding amide protons this will be I plus 1, this will be I and this will be I minus 1. So these ones are detected during the T3 period ok and uh, now if you do a Fourier transformation 3D Fourier transformation what you get here? You get here a 3 dimensional spectrum F3 axis has the amide protons, F1 has nitrogen and F2 also has nitrogen, F2 also has nitrogen ok. Now, if we were to take a cross section, if you take a cross section through the through this 3D spectrum, how does it look like? Suppose I take a F1 cross section at a particular 
uh, F2 chemical shift at a particular F2 chemical shift I take this plane, I take this plane and show it here. So, this is the F1 F3 plane at a particular F2 chemical shift ok, at a particular F2 chemical shift that is I have here a particular F2 is equal to Ni and this is the Ni of the HIN of the F2. Then I will see 3 peaks, this is 3 peaks I, I minus 1 and I plus 1 all the 3 we see here. And correspondingly if I were to take a F1 cross section that means I take cross section through this here, through this plane at this particular chemical shift, then I will get here the F2, F3 cross section. The F2, F3 cross section has the same 3 peaks, but at the respective amide proton chemical shifts. See these are 3 different chemical shifts uh, of the individual 3 residues, these 3 peaks. So what do you see of this? This is like a triplet filter through the HSQC. What do I mean by that? So suppose I have a HSQC spectrum, this is N15 and this is HN, you have lots of peaks here, okay. you have many peaks for the 2D spectrum. Uh, but now out of these 3 consecutive residues, whichever are the 3 consecutive residues and you will figure, uh, filter them out in this particular plane, you will filter that in the particular plane. Okay. So, therefore, it is called as the, at the particular F2, uh, F1 chemical shift, the particular N15 chemical shift, you get 3 peaks which are neighbors, okay. the self peaks, I minus 1 peak and the I plus 1 peak, all the 3 peaks you are seeing in this. Therefore, this is called as a triplet filter through the HSQC spectrum and this is extremely useful because you immediately know which plane you have to go to identify the next residue. You do not have to scan through the N15 planes as in the case of HNCA to figure out where the uh, C alpha becomes a self peaks. Here you do not worry about the C alphas and the N15 dispersion is always very good compared to the C alpha chemical shifts in most proteins and the particularly in the case of disorder proteins, intrinsically disorder proteins or loop segments in proteins you have poor chemical shift dispersion for the C alphas, but the N15 dispersion is always good. Therefore, you can see this kind of um, peak separation in every case. Okay. And another important thing you have to notice and that is I have used different colors here. See I have used one particular color for the self peaks, the residue of the same residue and I have one particular color. For the two others I have to have different colors because they have negative sign. If this is positive sign, this is the negative sign okay, and vice versa, whichever one you want to choose that way. So they have opposite signs and that also shows up here and this is extremely useful in a generalized sense. But another important um, um, feature of this is this sign pattern what we are having depends upon what is the sequence in the triplet. What kind of a sequence do you have in the triplet? Is there a glycine in the triplet sequence or not? Now if there is a glycine in the triplet sequence, these color combinations will change and that is an extremely useful factor because you, you will be able to figure out where you are along the polypeptide chain. As you are walking along the polypeptide chain, if you hit a glycine, you hit a different kind of a peak pattern. Therefore, that will appear as a checkpoint and that is demonstrated here in this particular slide. Okay, what we have of course if there is a proline, if there is a proline it will not produce a peak therefore you will have only 2 peaks not 3 peaks because there is no amide proton on the proline. But whereas in a generalized sense you will have the self peak which is positive and the 2 sequential peaks will have negative sign. I represent this as Zx Z prime, X is the central peak which is the self residue and Z and Z prime are the I minus 1 and I plus 1 residue. Okay, these ones have a negative sign as indicated in the previous one if this is positive. The square indicates that it is the self peak or the um, of the same residue and the circle indicates it is a sequential peak. Now similarly if I have here a proline with a glycine, with a glycine there. Now the glycine has a very distinct chemical shift and uh, with, with regard to the N15 and those ones will appear at the top in the N15 chemical shift. Okay. Therefore, this will produce a distinct pattern you can immediately identify that this is the glycine here. 
Now if there is a glycine in the middle of a sequence if the glycine is here at the end then of course the, uh, the X residue will show a peak here and the glycine sequential peak will appear here. If the PGX that means the glycine in the middle then you will have the square which is on the top but this will have a negative sign. See unlike this X which is a positive sign the glycine self peak will have a negative sign and you see everywhere where there is a glycine in the middle it has a negative sign. And this is an extremely useful factor because you usually immediately figure out that where you are along the polypeptide chain. Now these are the others where there is no proline and each one of them has 3 peaks, each one of the peaks. If there is a glycine in the middle then that self peak is negative and then you have a positive and a negative combination here. And if the glycine is at the I minus 1 position then the self peak is positive and you will have a negative and positive combination, negative and a positive combinations here. Therefore, you see this peak patterns which you are seeing is extremely important in the walking along the polypeptide chain. You immediately identify okay are you doing the right thing or not, you go from one residue to another residue and if you hit a glycine in the middle then you must get this sort of peak patterns positive and negative combinations and that will be extremely useful for rapid assignments of your polypeptide chain. Now there is another complementary experiment of this which is called as HNCN. Okay. Now this experiment the magnetization transfer pathway goes like this. So here you start from the again the amide proton and you go to the nitrogen 15 here from the nitrogen 15 you go to the carbonyl you do not go to the C alpha you go to the carbonyl of residue I minus 1. From this carbonyl of I minus 1 you go to the C alpha of I minus 1 during this period and then from the C alpha of I minus 1 where do you go? You go to the nitrogen of I minus 1 and nitrogen of I and here you type have frequency label you call this as T2 and the T1 is here. The T1 therefore along the N15 axis you have the T1 and here you also have the T2. Okay. So therefore then you have here and the nit from the amide from the nitrogen you go to the amide proton and you have here this system. Therefore what you have here and also in the same case in the previous one also. So T1, T1 is N15, T2 is also N15 and T3 is amide. This was all the also the case in the in the previous one. Maybe I should also write that here. Uh, yeah. So here also, T1 is N15. T2 is also N15, and T3 is amide. So therefore, you will have three-dimensional spectra in this manner. Okay. So now if I take the three dimensional spectrum of this what is the, what is its uh, content okay. So let us look here you take the what are the correlations we will get see I am not going to the three, three residues there I will only have two okay. So if I take a cross section here through the at a particular F2 at a particular F2 position that means I have the F1 F3 cross section F1 F3 cross section has two peaks one particular to this own residue and then to the I minus 1. Okay. Start from the HN of I, HN of I I am seeing to I minus 1 and I correct. So, so here HN of I I residue to I and I minus 1, uh, I and I plus 1 okay sorry this will give you I and I plus 1 uh, because you have, you have to write down similarly for the HI of uh, I plus 1 also. HNI where it will come you have to combine these you have to write such a transfer pathways for HNI, HNI minus 1 and HNI plus 1. When you do that you will see that the particular HNI you will see two peaks one corresponding to the I of uh, the N15 of I and N15 of I plus 1 you will see two peaks in the F1 F3 plane. Whereas if you look at the F2 F3 plane F2 F3 plane that is at a particular F1 which is the I that is this F1I what are you seeing you are seeing 2 N uh, nitrogen which are I and I minus 1 okay therefore and and they will appear at the respective HN chemical shifts 
and that is what is shown here at the respective HN chemical shifts I minus 1 and I you are seeing two different things. Now this is like a doublet filter. I see here two peaks which correspond to the I and the I minus 1 residues along the polypeptide chain. Okay. Now here again you will see interesting uh, peak patterns, peak patterns once again you will see different kinds of positive and negative combinations and again once there is a proline of course you will see only two peaks here but you will see two peaks in every case here. Okay. But the patterns of positive and negative combinations are quite distinct compared to the previous one. Therefore, this will allow you to identify which are the sequential peaks, which are the self peaks and which direction you are going. The important thing is this will provide you a direction. In the earlier case where it was not easy to figure out which is I minus 1 and which is I plus 1. But now you see you have only I minus 1 coming in this plane. And in this plane, you are counting only I plus 1. Okay. So, therefore, it provides a directionality for your walking through the polypeptide chain, and that is an important uh, observation. And this will have uh, a significant value in your uh, sequential resonance assignment. Okay. What is it? This positive positive here, very unique. This positive positive for a PGG sequence. And for a XZZ sequence also we see positive positive here. If you have glycine in the middle and you have X and Z again you have positive positive but if glycine is in the NI minus 1 positive you have negative negative. This is very interesting. So if you have ZZZ then you have positive positive on the top here. So if you have this situation negative negative. So these are extremely important combinations of uh, peak uh, signs and which will uh, you, you can cross check therefore these appear as checkpoints in your walk through the polypeptide chain. So this shows experimental illustration of this uh, spectra application here a particular protein uh, uh, is probably FKBP or ubiquity and I do not remember but you can see here so sequential correlations how they are appearing positive negative combinations. See this is phi, phi so this is shown on the top the sequence is given here. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 for the same 3 sequence here through the HNN spectrum how you are walking and how you are doing it here for the HNCN. You can do the sequential walk through both the spectra whether you want to do it through HNCN or HNN you can do that. So you see you go from phi to here see the appear sign then you go from here to here, here to here, here to here your same positive negative combinations but now as soon as you come here to the G10. See as soon as you come to the G10 you have to have 2 positive peaks there. See it is TGK sequence, TGK, G is in the middle and that must give you positive and positive positive combinations and this is what we saw here. So see this is this, this portion XZZ, so this G is in the middle and XZ can be any other residue and as soon as you reach there you must get a positive positive peak. And in fact you see at this point you see a positive positive peak and the immediate next one should be negative negative okay? because that one is GK, uh, GKT that is GXZ. So therefore you will have here negative negative combinations and then after that again the G is gone so you have positive negative, positive negative, positive negative and go on things like that. The same feature will show up here in this particular case as well. Okay? So you have here in HNN as well you go through the sequential walk from 5 to 6, 6 to 7 and 7 to 8 and so on and so forth. You can walk through the polypeptide chain along there and notice once more here. So as soon as you come here you see 2 negative peaks and this is the G10 just as you had here 2 positive peaks and you get 2 negative peaks and the positive peak here. Okay? And the immediate next one will be 2 positive peaks and 1 negative peak. And this is the guarantee that you have not made any mistake in your uh, sequential walk all through the polypeptide chain. So this is therefore extremely useful for obtaining rapid assignments in proteins. Regardless of the size, especially in the int intrinsically disordered proteins uh, where there are flexible domains and uh, uh, is very difficult to obtain assignments without this sort of a dispersion. So N15 dispersion is always good, so you can get resonance assignments in a 
rapid manner and in an unambiguous manner. Uh, this therefore experiments have been very successful in uh, analyzing unfolding pathways or folding pathways of proteins or um, aggregation pathways of proteins. Uh, these strategies have been used and this was possibly we will discuss later when we actually discuss more of the applications of these methods and uh, to draw more information about the biology of that one, the structural biology of those one. Here our focus is on discussing the methods and how the methods are useful to derive the information and how they have been developed to circumvent some problems of um, peak dispersion or, or difficulties with regard to the uh, assignments or with regard to the structures in the proteins where there are unfolded regions in the folded regions together you will have difficulties. So the methods development has been di driven by such kind of problems and the applications of these we will also discuss more as we go into particular kinds of uh, questions with regard to the folding, unfolding, aggregation, etc. So, okay, so I think we can stop here.